our story starts with Midori, walking down a quiet street late at night, feeling really tired. She's been working a lot of extra hours this past month, just like any other Japanese workers. Her main goal is to get home and sleep. Finally, she makes it through her front door, but then something unexpected happens. The angel of death is waiting for her. Midori collapses to the floor, thinking her time has come to an end. She starts crying, realizing how short her life was. It seems like the overworked swan has claimed another victim. As her spirit leaves her body, she can't believe she worked herself to death. What hurts even more is that no one was there for her in her final moment, and she couldn't say a last goodbye to her parents. The deity of her world hears her complaints about the way she died. He asks if she wants him to intervene. Suddenly, Midori finds herself in a different dimension. The deity explains that her lifespan is fixed, but he can change how she meets her end. The deity reveals that there are humans in a world called Astalan who are mistreating other species. The deity wants Midori to be reborn in a world called Astellan and leave with humans there. He needs her help in deciding whether those humans deserve to be wiped out. Midori is hesitant about taking on such a big responsibility and kindly refuses. The deity tries to persuade her by offering special powers, letting her choose from abilities like teleportation or causing great damage. In a slightly frantic manner, Midori expresses that all she wants is the ability to pet fluffy things. This baffles the deity. She explains that she couldn't find stress relief from petting her parents' cat because it didn't like her. For Midori, petting fluffy animals is the only thing that soothes her tired heart. The deity, still puzzled, decides to grant her a special power where all creatures, except humans, will naturally like her. Grateful for her help, he reincarnates her into the other world. Midori tries to tell the deity to wait because she hasn't agreed yet, but it's too late. She opens her eyes and finds herself in a baby's body, surrounded by her new family. Her mother names her Nefertima during the naming ceremony, but her older sister shortens it to Nefertima. She discovers she's on Laria, the largest of the world's three continents, in the kingdom of Gash, her new home. Nefertima is the third child in the royal ducal family of Osf. Three years have passed since her birth, and her older brother Ralph congratulates her on reaching a milestone by giving her flowers. Her older sister Kara creates magical fireworks to make her happy. While running around, Nefertima trips, but the family pet saves her. Her love for animals becomes evident as a multitude of creatures surround her, much to the family's amusement. Her mother comments on how animals are always around her little girl, and they get a bit worried when she's overwhelmed by their love. A few days later, Nefertima's mother tells her that she needs to go to the royal palace for work. Unsure of what to do with Nefertima because her father is working and Ralph and Kara are at the academy, where animals aren't allowed, the mother wonders if Nefertima can be a good girl if she takes her along alone. Nefertima promises and gets excited about leaving the house. As they pass through the market, Nefertima observes the cheerful, lively, and peaceful people, finding it hard to believe they could be the type to persecute others. Upon reaching the palace, Nefertima's mother ensures that she'll be okay by herself and casts a protection spell before heading off to work. Nefertima waits quietly for her mother's return but soon gets bored. She looks out of the window, notices a bird, and decides to chase after it. Losing sight of the bird, she finds herself in the palace garden, surrounded by creatures that inhabit the area. Nefertima cuddles them, calling the royal palace a fluffy paradise. Suddenly, the presence of a predator in the bushes causes all the animals to run. A large white tiger emerges, casting a shadow over Nefertima and prompting her to turn around. They share a moment of staring at each other before she expresses her excitement about meeting such a rare and fluffy creature. The tiger comes over, licks her face, and encourages her to hug it. Nefertima is amazed by how sleek and soft its fur is, realizing that this creature must be exceptionally rare. The white tiger repositions itself to allow her to get on its back. Recognizing the cue, Nefertima gets on, and the creature gives her a grand tour of the garden. A voice addresses the tiger, asking about the object on its back. Nefertima looks over to find Prince Wilherd sitting on a tree. He acknowledges that the tiger is well behaved but reminds her that it's still a beast. Wondering who the dashing young man before her is, Nefertima is surprised when he jumps down and takes her off the creature. She protests and demands he put her down, but he decides to playfully carry her like a rucksack. The tiger notices her distress and calmly places her down. The prince is surprised to see this behavior from Lars, the tiger's name, as it's rare for him to take a liking to anyone other than his master. He asks Nefertima why a child her age is in the garden, and she informs him that her mother is working on the premises. She officially introduces herself, piquing the prince's interest due to her being from the Oss family. Lars lifts her up as he guides her through the palace, and they reach a room where he knocks before entering. Both Nefertima and her father are surprised to see each other. The prince brings her down from the creature, and her father wonders why she's at the palace. The prince explains that he thought she seemed lost, so he brought her to her father. Nefertima corrects him, saying she wasn't lost, and adds that she was playing with Lars in the yard. This revelation surprises the duke and the king. 
Nefertima is asked to explain how it all happened. She tells her father that she came to the palace with her mother, got lonely, and Lars decided to play with her. Her father is charmed by her cuteness and apologizes for her loneliness while thanking the prince for bringing her to him. The duke's gratitude makes Nefertima realize that she was dealing with royalty. Her father encourages her to thank the prince for his help, and she politely curtsies. It dawns on her that she's dealing with someone royal when her father addresses the prince as Wilhurt. The prince playfully ruffles her hair while commenting on her politeness, annoying her. The king then interrupts to get to know Nefertima, giving her a chance to showcase her refinement for her age. She gracefully introduces herself, impressing the monarch, who introduces himself as King Goldie. He asks if she enjoyed playing with Lars before extending an invitation for her to return. When they return home, her mother scolds her a bit for running off, causing her to worry. Nefertima apologizes, but her mother can't believe that her daughter rode a sky tiger. Her father clarifies that her mother is talking about Lars. The girl pleads with her mother to visit again, revealing that the king has officially invited her. Her mother agrees under the condition that Nefertima doesn't visit Lars when anyone's watching. She explains that Lars is a holy beast with elemental powers, drawing on divine energies. Holy beasts typically form strong bonds only with their masters, so her mother wants Nefertima to play with Lars in secret. Nefertima agrees and runs off to play with Lars. Her mother is still shocked that her daughter befriended a sky tiger, and the duke speculates that she might have some kind of special power. Time passes, and Nefertima, along with her parents, goes to the academy to observe Ralph and Kara. She's extra excited about the new environment to explore. Her mother warns her not to repeat what she did at the palace and takes her hand as they head to their VIP section, where maids wait to serve them tea and cakes. Nefertima is amazed by the arena, and her father explains that life-size soldier dolls are controlled by the students. She compares it to chess to help her understand. Ralph steps up, takes control of an army, and defeats his opponents with expert tactics. Unable to contain her excitement, Nefertima rushes to celebrate with her brother, but she cuts it short to use the toilet. On her way out, she spots Tristan trying to provoke her brother, knowing they could be opponents soon. Annoyed, she insults Tristan, who raises his hand to hit her. Ralph steps in the way, but a call from Wilhard stops him. They all bow to the monarch, but Wilhard dismisses the formality, more interested in knowing why Tristan raised his hand against a child. Tristan denies it, surprising Ralph, and Wilhard confesses that he and Nefertima got acquainted when he helped her find her way to the duke at the palace. The prince picks her up again but calms her down by offering her unlimited access to the palace. Tristan tries to protest, but he's told that the king already approves. Wilhard takes the opportunity to warn Tristan that Nefertima is under his protection, making it clear he understands and quickly excuses himself. The prince's attention turns to Nefertima's black eyes, getting a little startled because people in this world aren't supposed to have black eyes. She insists they're blue and turns away. Nefertima changes the topic by allowing him to call her by her nickname, so he reciprocates, allowing her to address him as well after the commotion. They return to the stands where Nefertima's mother and father show their respects to Prince Wilhurd upon his arrival. However, he insists they be at ease as he has come as a student of the academy seeking guidance from graduates. Just in time for Kara's test, a monster is summoned by a magic circle and she gets into position. To everyone's surprise, a fire dragon appears in the arena and the prince points out that it's a mighty holy beast, the same class as Lars. The teacher orders to protect the students as the crowd panics a little. The duke reveals that Kara's fire skill is high, but her water skill is low, putting her at a disadvantage. Despite the danger, Kara seems determined to fight the creature and their mother approves of her decision. Nefertima, concerned, jumps off the stand against her family's warnings. A strange power activates, allowing her to have a soft landing. The baby notes that something saved her and thanks it before dashing in front of the creature. As soldiers prepare to attack the creature, Nefertima orders them to stop, shocking everyone, and the episode comes to an end. The episode continues with our young heroine, Nefertima, bravely stalls the guards to protect the great fiery dragon. Initially advising her to flee, the dragon later reveals his own reasons for resisting, possibly due to being provoked by the guards. Despite the tense situation, Nefertima gathers courage and pleads with the dragon not to harm humans. Worried about the potential danger posed by the dragon's formidable scales against water magic, Nefertima boldly expresses her desire to touch them. The dragon, intrigued by her request, approaches her and asks if she truly wants to feel its scales. With an affirmative response from Nefertima, the dragon, somewhat surprised, inquires if she's not afraid to be so close. As the tension builds, the guards are on the verge of attacking. However, Prince Wilhurd intervenes just in time 
preventing the clash. This allows Nefertima to achieve her goal of touching the red dragon's scales, much to the surprise of everyone, including her own family and the prince. It's an unusual sight for a little girl to interact with a dragon in such a manner, but Nefertima remains unfazed, having accomplished her objective. Despite the unexpected encounter, the dragon, named Saul, decides to depart. However, before leaving, he assures Nefertima that when she grows up, he will accept her as his mistress. This revelation adds an intriguing twist to the unfolding story, leaving Nefertima and those around her in anticipation of what the future holds. To ensure that Nefertima can find the dragon in the future, Saul presents her with a magical orb. This orb adapts to her preferences, taking the form she envisions. Recognizing its potential as a wearable item, Nefertima decides it should be a beautiful backpack in the shape of a rabbit. This choice is strategic, as it conceals the orb's true nature from those unfamiliar with it, including the dragon. Saul elaborates on the orb's capabilities, explaining that it can connect with the carrier's spirit. Moreover, it grants the user the ability to wield dragon magic, but only when the orb is in close proximity. Nefertima, grateful for this extraordinary gift, commits to wearing the orb every day, acknowledging its protective function in times of danger. When Nefertima inquires about the dragon's name, Saul reveals that he is called Saul. With this revelation, Saul takes his leave, promising to accept Nefertima as his mistress in the future. However, despite this positive turn of events, concerns linger within Nefertima's family, especially her sister Karna and Prince Wilherd. Who remains uneasy. Wilherd's worry prompts him to express concern to Nefertima's father, urging him to be cautious. Aware of the potential dangers that lie ahead, Nefertima's father understands the gravity of the situation. Realizing that powerful and greedy individuals may seek to exploit his daughter's connection with the dragon, he contemplates taking matters into his own hands. Considering the purchase of knives, he contemplates personally safeguarding Nefertima against those who may attempt to exploit her for the power of the dragon. However, Nefertima and her family dismiss the concerns as an overreaction. Later, Nefertima, accompanied by her parents, headed towards King Ofs's court. During the formal introduction, Nefertima's father, Duke Derland, and her mother, Cerulea Ospheche, presented themselves as affluent and influential individuals. Despite their status, Nefertima felt a bit uneasy, especially when the king inquired about the alleged bond between her and the great fiery dragon. Her parents clarified that it wasn't a formal pact, as the dragon had departed on its own accord. Nevertheless, the king was keen to know if Nefertima could harness the dragon's powers. Derland cautiously responded that if his daughter desired, she might have borrowed some of the dragon's power, though he couldn't be certain. This response didn't entirely satisfy King Galdi Russ, who pressed Derland to clarify if there was nothing to fear. In response, Derland, feeling the weight of the situation, knelt and swore an oath by the surname Offs. He reassured the king that nothing untoward would happen, a gesture that surprised Nefertima. Her father's use of the royal name in his oath, a potentially punishable offense, underscored the seriousness of the situation and the sincerity behind his pledge. The king, though somewhat convinced by Duke Derlin's oath, still sought more information regarding the appearance of the great fiery dragon. Salazar, the director of the magical laboratory, explained that the magic summoning circle was error-free, and his student lacked the power to summon such a powerful creature. In response to the king's inquiry about how the dragon manifested, Salazar suggested it could be the divine will of a god. Nefertima quickly recalled her encounter with Saul and considered the possibility that he was a divine being. It resonated with her growing understanding of the world and her duty to communicate with God about whether humans should be spared or not. The king and Duke Derlin both found solace in this explanation, believing that God had a plan for them, and the fiery dragon could be a valuable asset to humanity. Identifying the true problem as a manipulative individual who exploited the name of God for personal gain, Nefertimer recognized that it was too early to draw conclusions. Her primary focus was on fulfilling her duty when she grew older. Currently, she enjoyed simple pleasures like caressing cute animals. However, Prince Wilherd's interference became a source of annoyance for Nefertima. Unable to confront him directly due to his royal status, she trembled with suppressed rage. Fortunately, Wilherd noticed her distress and suggested playing with Lars, a proposal that the king found appropriate diverting Nefertima from matters beyond her age. As Lars approached, the prince asked him to take her to feed the animals, a request that Nefertima readily embraced. The entire room was taken aback when Nefertima fearlessly fed a tiger with her own hands, miraculously avoiding any harm. Though inevitable drooling occurred, a maid promptly offered tissues to the young girl. 
grateful for the gesture, Nefertima thanked the servant, who couldn't help but be delighted by the compliment, although she withdrew promptly. Undeterred, Nefertima continued to enjoy her time with Lars, eventually falling asleep on the celestial beast. Her father, astonished by her cuteness, marveled at the scene. Onlookers were equally amazed that an ordinary girl could peacefully sleep on such a magnificent creature. Unbeknownst to them, Nefertima had struck a deal with the dragon, potentially benefiting the kingdom in the future. Amidst the tranquility, the Minister of the Interior, Olivia, approached Duke Derland. She sought an explanation about how Nefertima, lacking mana, could be so friendly with numerous animals. Concerned for her safety, Captain of the Royal Knights and Royal Guard, Selnan, assured Derland that his daughter would be protected. Selnan even offered the assistance of a royal guard to watch over her throughout the day. While expressing gratitude, Derland acknowledged the uncertainty of the future. However, he was secretly pleased to find individuals like Selnan willing to help. As a bat, another figure in the room, approached, offering to take care of Nefertima and ensure her transformation into a Santa. Derland firmly declined, stating that his daughter wouldn't become a puppet. These words offended a bat who, feeling slighted, began spreading rumors and questioning Nefertima's lineage, asserting that she might not be his daughter. Quickly, Cerulia approached her husband, reminding him of certain passages from the Bible that highlighted the consequences of infidelity with a mark of depravity. The topic was swiftly diverted before the king. When Nefertima woke up from her nap, she found her parents relieved, thanks to the king, who lifted her into his arms, reassuring her that there was nothing to fear. Prince Wilhard, wanting to congratulate Nefertima, offered her a gift. They waited in a room where a man named Fields, the leader of the second squad of the Royal Guard, appeared. Fields, remarkably handsome, was designated by the prince to take care of Nefertima. Winfield, as he preferred to be called, would escort Nefertima to a special place. Upon arrival, they were formally introduced to a caretaker named Dan, who preferred a more informal demeanor. Winfield insisted on a more refined attitude, causing some tension between them. Dan led Nefertima to explore the castle, revealing the area where little dragons and wingless subspecies were cared for. Nefertima expressed her admiration for the dragons, deeming them too cute. Dan, the caretaker, seemed to love his job, and Nefertima, eager to interact with the dragons, attempted to use the orb Saul had given her. Unfortunately, this caused chaos as the dragons became agitated. Seeking refuge, Nefertima and Dan found themselves near a large dragon named Gizel. To everyone's surprise, Nefertima confidently interacted with Gizel, who decided to play with the dragons for a while, and assured them he would return to let Nefertima ride him. When Gizel sensed the presence of the fiery dragon in Nefertima, she explained that her orb allowed her to communicate with the dragons. Gizel recognized her as the maiden of the dragons, welcoming her to a beautiful field of flowers. As Nefertima enjoyed her time with the dragons, Dan wondered how she knew Gizel's name and how she managed to ride the proud dragon. The surprises continued when Nefertima returned, accompanied by Lars. Thus, an unexpected gathering formed, a little girl surrounded by sacred beasts, and dragons, cared for by the prince's dragon and a bunch of others. In the next episode, Dan takes our little Nema to a rare animal's ranch, where they're greeted by the captain of the Royal Beast Knight Legions. This captain, known as Lestin Ogma, quickly befriends her and told her to call him Les. Nema, though initially calm, reveals her deep excitement to meet Les, who seems gentle at first but is skeptical of Nema's power of controlling animals. As they explore the vast ranch, Dan shares a recent incident where the leader of his main dragon pack allowed a little girl, whom he barely knew, to ride one of the dragons. This revelation surprises and even evokes envy from Leston and his own dragons, as they never experienced such a connection with their riders. Driven by curiosity and a desire to witness the depth of the bond between animals and humans, Leston decides to take Nema to the expansive Beast Ranch. The ranch, situated on a large piece of land adjacent to the castle, is home to various animals, including many horses. As they stroll through the ranch, Leston invites Nema to experience something she'd love, assembling with one of his horses. The anticipation builds as a horse responds to Leston's call and approaches them. Nema couldn't contain her excitement as she wants to ran her fingers through the silky and elegant fur of the horse named Yuaz, the leader of the herd. However, her attempts to introduce herself to Yuwa's were met with indifference. Yuwa's nonchalantly ignored her, even exhaling in a dismissive manner. This unexpected behavior left Nema frozen, as it was the first time an animal had ignored her. Dan and the others were equally surprised, and quickly apologized, explaining that Yuwa's had a somewhat capricious nature. Despite their efforts, Yuwa's remained unresponsive, and the apologies seemed futile. 
Undeterred, Nema decided not to give up so easily. She attempted to convince Yuas to play with her, but he continued to ignore her. Dan and the others apologized again, suggesting that Yuaz's behavior might be due to his capricious nature. However, this only saddened Nema further. Realizing that she needed to understand Yuaz's perspective, Nema approached the horse, hugging him and assuring him that she meant no harm. She explained that Yuaz wasn't capricious, but rather behaved that way because she was new to the place. As a leader, he was simply protecting his pack from potential harm. This revelation made Dan and the others reflect on their assumptions. Apologizing sincerely this time, Dan and Nema managed to mend the misunderstanding with Yuaz. With a newfound understanding, they were finally able to ride one of the horses. The chosen horse, named Hugh, turned out to be one of the calmest and fastest, offering both Dan and Nema an exhilarating experience. Despite Dan's lack of experience with horses, he found the courage to enjoy the ride, marking a memorable moment in their adventure. Nema couldn't help but envision the sheer beauty of the white horse, Hugh, imagining how spectacular it would be to see her older brother Ralph riding it. Bus urged them to continue their exploration of the vast ranch, emphasizing its sheer size. Setting off across the meadow, they encountered a variety of peculiar animals, including a giant boar. This massive boar was on a quest for ground-dwelling insects. Emma, unfamiliar with this creature, received an enlightening explanation from Dan. However, their peaceful ride took an unexpected turn when a group of unfamiliar wild boars began to chase them. Les quickly reassured them that these were just playful baby wild boars seeking to join in the adventure. Despite the explanation, Nema couldn't shake off the unease of being pursued by a swarm of wild boars. Taking responsibility, Yuez skillfully diverted the boars, immediately calming Nema, who expressed her gratitude for his assistance. Continuing their exploration, Les introduced them to creatures like wakas, birds that resembled ducks but were exceptionally white and incredibly fast. He shared that wakas were utilized as messengers during emergencies due to their remarkable speed. The mention of speed sparked Nema's interest, and she expressed a desire to ride one, despite the need for prior training. Yoshu, one of the most skilled wakas, was chosen for Nema's adventure. Les cautioned her to be gentle, as squeezing too hard might trigger an instinctive response from Yoshu. Undeterred by the warning, Nema was determined to experience the exhilaration of riding a waka. Although those around her couldn't quite believe her audacity, Nema was ready to embrace the challenge and fulfill her adventurous spirit. Nema, don't worry about how fast the wakas can go. Without any hesitation, he offered everyone a ride across the meadow at such high speed that it almost caused trouble for our main character again. Due to the strong wind, Nema couldn't breathe well. However, Les noticed this quickly and used magic to block the strong air currents. For a moment, it seemed to make Nema feel better, but Les apologized because he forgot to activate the spell earlier. Despite the apology, Nema wasn't upset. She felt it would have been better if the spell was activated before. The ride on Yoshu continued at great speed. When Nema got off, she felt dizzy and amazed by those who regularly rode wakas. Les shared that they weren't even going at half the usual speed of Yoshu. Nema was exhausted from the trip, and Dan couldn't resist making fun of her condition. Meanwhile, in the sky, a strange bird of prey appeared, which Les called a rain hawk. With a simple whistle, he called the bird down, surprising Nema. Dan recognized the bird and explained that its main mission is to deliver letters. Despite feeling a bit envious of having the bird close, Nema knew she was too small to hold it. However, her envy turned into curiosity when she learned that the bird had a message for them. Upon reading the message, Les apologized to Nema and Dan, explaining that one of his men had run into trouble, and it was his responsibility to go back and fix it. However, Nema wasted no time in negotiating to continue their journey. Realizing they couldn't complete the full tour that day, despite the promise made to her, she suggested another exciting idea. Nema wanted Dan to take her on a ride with their dragons. While they gathered with Dan's men, Nema noticed the absence of a white elk, one of the rarest species they had. With limited time, the leader ordered his subordinates to search for the elusive animal. As the team went off in search of the white elk, Nema found herself reflecting on the peculiar events of the day, from the loss of the white elk to connecting with the dragon. Surprisingly, even Yoshu allowed her to ride without any issues. Despite the twists, the focus remained on finding the white elk. In a quick turn of events, the scene shifted, revealing Nema standing next to a celestial beast and the recently lost white elk. She nonchalantly explained that after they took her to see the dinosaurs in their stable, she got lost in the forest. Lars, who came to her rescue, led them to the moose. Acting as a caregiver, Lars reminded her to be more careful in the future. Nema assured him that she would heed the advice, bringing a somewhat humorous end to their adventurous day. 
Deep down, a suspicion crept in that the little girl possessed the power of love for animals, something they never thought could exist. Taking into account the genuine affection the little girl displayed towards the creatures, it became undeniable that she shared the same love for animals as them. Slowly, an envious feeling began to grow among them towards the little girl. As time passed, they found themselves a few days into the future, celebrating Nema's birthday. Her parents congratulated her, and on this special occasion, Nema had the opportunity to make a birthday wish. Without hesitation, she asked for a ride, expressing her desire to go to town. However, Dan was hesitant about letting the little girl go to a potentially dangerous place like the city. Despite assurances from Culia that there wouldn't be any problems, Dan remained concerned, especially considering both of his daughters going alone. To address this, Nema's mother struck a deal with Paul, a servant of the house, to accompany and take care of them on the trip. Accompanied by Karna and Paul, Nema explored the business district of the town. Karna took the opportunity to teach her younger sister about the royal palace, explaining its four special sectors that offered a breathtaking view of the city from above. But Karna knew they needed to grab a bite first. They dashed towards numerous food stalls, where Karna handed money to her younger sister, allowing her to indulge in whatever she desired. The first thing Nema wanted to try was the local turkey, but she didn't want to enjoy it alone. She bought servings for both her sister and Paul, who initially hesitated but couldn't refuse Nema's heartfelt requests. While enjoying their meal, a tempting aroma caught Nema's attention. Paul explained that it was coming from some delicious sweets called pepes, a local treat. Without hesitation, Nema hurried to purchase a substantial amount of these sweets, planning to share them with her parents and everyone back at the mansion. However, Karna found the sweetness of Nema's gesture overwhelming. She couldn't help but give her little sister a tight hug. Afterward, Karna decided to take Nema to one of their favorite cafes. Unfortunately, their luck took a turn when a girl, seemingly known to Karna, entered the cafe. The girl wasted no time in bothering Karna, questioning why she cared about a sister who likely wasn't even related, given Nema's distinct black eyes. These words momentarily affected Nema, but Karna had grown stronger mentally. She asserted that those who couldn't recognize the greatness of her little sister didn't deserve their noble status. This conviction was so strong that even the king of Gash acknowledged the extraordinary qualities of Nema. To avoid any further issues, Karna and her little sister returned home quite late after their day in town. When Nema opened the door, she was greeted with a surprise party organized by everyone. Overwhelmed with emotion, Nema couldn't help but cry tears of joy. She was deeply touched that, despite everyone's responsibilities, they went out of their way to give her a surprise celebration. Derlin recognized it as a special day and proposed a toast in Nema's honor. The celebration continued with gifts pouring in. The kings presented her with the most exquisite jewelry, while the prince, being protective, gave her a special amulet for protection. The gifts didn't stop there, Nema received clothes, a small sword, an animal book from the time, and a unique scale pin crafted from a dragon's neck, one of the strongest at the time. To make the day even more memorable, Les brought a small rain hawk for Nema, remembering her excitement when she first saw one. All these thoughtful gestures made it one of the best birthdays for Nema. Before going to sleep, she knew she had to give a name to her new little friend, and she decided on Knox. Together, they enjoyed the beautiful view of that special night, creating lasting memories. The following day, Knox and Nema continued practicing together. From a distance, both Dan and Les applauded how well Knox and Nema got along in such a short time. The small but strong bond between them made the onlookers marvel. Nema assured everyone that their friendship had grown quickly, and she insisted that it was only possible because they had become good friends. Regardless, she wanted Knox to return the next day to continue practicing, believing that they could make Knox soar even higher. However, her enthusiasm was dampened when Nema revealed that she might not be able to continue playing with them for much longer. Her studies were starting on the same day, and she might not have the time. A little later, we see Nema studying on her own, and through the door, a servant introduces their new tutor named Annalie de Sa. Nema, judging by Annalie's appearance, recognizes her as an exemplary lady. She politely introduced herself, but Annalie didn't seem pleased. When the servant left, Annalie quickly changed her attitude. She emphasized to Nema that for a lady, proper speech is crucial. Confused, Nema didn't fully grasp Annalie's point, thinking she had introduced herself correctly. However, Annalie pointed out that Nema still addressed her parents as Pa 
and Ma, not understanding the importance of refined speech. Without warning, Nema received a painful blow to her arm, as Nema had not responded appropriately, angering the young girl and prompting her to show her displeasure. But for Dasa, this was unacceptable, as a true lady should never show any sign of displeasure on her face. When the servant returned to the room and saw them so close, he assumed they had become friends, especially when Annalie began lying, claiming that they had become close very quickly. This caused Nema to gain a new enemy that day. Even on that same day, Nema continued to be reprimanded for having poor posture, a forced smile, and lacking knowledge on certain subjects. By the end of the day, Annalie assured her that she had learned the basics but still had many problems to overcome. Annalie mentioned that Nema's older siblings, who were also her students, were among the best she ever had. Nevertheless, Annalie was determined to mold Nema into a proper lady. As bedtime arrived, Nema couldn't shake off the unease with the situation. She was troubled, especially considering that her siblings probably didn't face the same treatment. Nema suspected that Annalie might be mocking her, and although she knew that accusing Annalie to her father would result in his wrath, the determined young girl decided not to give up. If Annalie wanted to play this way, Nema would defeat her at her own game. The next day, after a strong reprimand for not maintaining proper posture, we see Nema starting to respond appropriately, surprising Annalie. However, this wasn't mere chance, as Nema, in her previous life, perfected her fake smiles due to her unpleasant jobs. In the following lessons, Nema remained strong in her studies, determined to overcome the challenges presented by Annalie. But all her effort became evident during dinner with her family, as Nema didn't eat as usual, even going to bed earlier than usual, which worried her father and sister. Her mother and brother suspected something was amiss, but Nema wouldn't be ignored. Her mother wanted to know what was happening. They even considered taking her to the hospital just in case. However, Nema couldn't bear the situation any longer and ran as far as possible to keep her mother from finding out. In the midst of her escape, Ralph intercepted her with magic, slightly irritating Nema. Ralph genuinely wanted to know what was going on, and even her mother wanted to hear the truth. Nema simply wanted to escape the horrible situation. Eventually, Nema confessed that she hadn't said anything because this was her battle. She feared that if she did, they would expel Annalie. Her mother understood the situation after hearing these words but still asked if Nema had any plan. Annalie was renowned as the exemplary lady with unparalleled manners, and if Nema wanted to win, she had to match her in manners for it to be a real competition. Her brother promised to help her in every possible way, even taking her hand to activate one of his spells, which significantly lifted Nema's spirits. Ralph used his healing magic to alleviate her fatigue. Although at some point, Nema felt like her brother was cheating, he promised not to interfere anymore if she wished. He assured her that he only helped a little to make her a splendid lady. For this reason, her mother promised to handle her father and sister, allowing Nema to focus on her fight against Annalie without family pressure. Time passed, and a year went by. We see how Nema transformed into a proper lady, even surprising her father, who couldn't believe what he saw. Her behavior during tea time earned his praise, and Nema quickly credited her tutor, who was nearby and delighted to have finally turned Nema into a lady. However, deep down, despite Annalie's refined behavior, Nema didn't see her as a perfect lady after completing the course. She couldn't understand why she had this notion. Remembering her mother's advice about understanding her opponent well, Nema approached Paul to learn more about Annalie. Paul handed her a document and revealed that they had investigated Annalie when she sought a tutor. Although there was nothing remarkable to discuss, it didn't change the fact that Annalie came from a family of strong church believers. When Nema read the name of the Church of Creation, she remembered that Abat had presented himself as the leader of the same church. Later, during further studies, Annalie was discussing the kingdom's territories. Nema seized the opportunity and shared that she had heard about nearby southern realms suffering from severe droughts. Annalie congratulated Nema on being well informed, unaware that Nema was actually leading the conversation. She revealed that the summer drought had been so intense that it ruined crops, putting the people of those southern realms at risk of starvation. As a response, they sought help from neighboring realms and, notably, from the church. Two other kingdoms, including Nema's, decided to assist them. Despite the positive developments, Nema continued to pose questions. She wondered why the Church of Creation wasn't taking action. In her view, when someone is suffering, the instinct is to help. Annalie, however, simply stated that if the kingdom of Icoc had incurred God's wrath, assisting them would go against the divine will. Nemo, undeterred, pressed further, asking how Annalie knew that the drought was a divine punishment. Annalie claimed that her father of the church had received a divine revelation. Nemo, however, saw through the facade, knowing that the church's father was likely a charlatan who had fabricated the faith. 
This led her to question the logic behind God creating humans only to punish them in such horrific ways. Annalie, aware that the punished kingdom was one that accepted both humans and beast folk equally, suggested that perhaps they had done something to offend God. Nemer refused to give up and continued her inquiries, asking if Annalie knew anyone from that kingdom or any beast folk. Annalie, upon hearing such questions, reacted with surprise. She only laughed, asserting that someone like her would never approach something as disgusting and ugly. This response made Nemo realize that her tutor is easily deceived by words and believes herself superior to those who are suffering. Without hesitation, Nemo called her teacher a despicable person in every sense of the word. Annalie quickly felt offended, leading the young girl to receive a strong blow. However, Nemo understood that this was not education but rather violence as a reaction to personal anger. Undeterred, Nemo continued, emphasizing that she didn't want to become someone as horrible as Annalie, hating people she didn't even know. A true lady, she argued, would never behave in such a way. As the daughter of the Osp family, she felt the responsibility to become a lady who wouldn't embarrass them. Her words not only upset Annalie but also led her to claim that a lady shouldn't talk about politics. Nemma then questioned what the speech of a lady should be, wondering if it could only revolve around senseless topics. She challenged Annalie's suggestion that a lady should be silent like a doll, arguing that a proper conversation requires equal participation from both sides. The situation left her teacher unsure of how to handle it, prompting Annalie to leave the room without answers. This, finally, granted Nemma the victory she desired. However, upon returning to her family and noticing her father's concern about the slap on her cheek, Nemma knew that consequences might follow. She requested that her father not intervene in her fight, causing Dylan to worry about how much she resembled her mother. Nevertheless, he spoke formally with Annalie about the incident. As a result, Annalie continued to be Nemma's teacher, but with fewer days per week and a shift to easier subjects. This arrangement gave the young girl the time she needed to reunite with her friends and all the animals she had missed dearly. However, the next day, her father began discussing an inspection to the north of the kingdom and Nemma was already five years old, and her father wanted her to accompany him on a journey to the north. This excited the young girl, as there was much more to explore in that world. To get there, they had to use a large teleportation device, and once activated, they arrived at a place very similar to the previous one. An elderly man named Arnis Gilba introduced himself, knowing they had come to the northern region called Arsenta which thrilled Nemma. She eagerly stepped forward and opened the gates. Although the snow was beautiful, the cold was incredibly intense. Her father cast a spell of food to save her from the chill and provided winter clothes for protection. Despite traveling by carriage to their destination, it wasn't until nightfall that they reached the mayor's house, where they were warmly welcomed as if it were a celebration. However, Nemma was more concerned about why there was no snow in this place. During dinner and after tasting some wild boar, Nemma couldn't believe how delicious it was. She asked for more, and her father instructed her to prepare for the next day, as they would need her help in a significant situation. Even the strongest knights were having problems in the northern forest. Dylan wanted Saul, the dragon, to assist them. Although Nemma knew that Saul might end up causing more destruction than help, her father insisted on her trying to communicate with the dragon. Once she understood the plan, Nemma asked Saul if he knew about the monsters in the north. The dragon needed more information, so her father instructed Nemma to refer to the place as the Frostwater Forest, as Saul would likely recognize it. Saul was surprised that there were monsters in that area and asked for more information. Dylan explained that there were many goblins, ice spiders, and cobbles in the region. While Saul didn't know why the monsters were there, he mentioned that he lived much farther south. Dylan suspected that someone might have gathered the monsters in that location. Even though Nemma thought it might be the work of God, Dylan requested that they investigate why there were so many monsters in that area first thing in the morning, bringing the episodes to an end.